Hello, I'm Hannah Donner with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. Chandra is bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls, webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's first Young ADC Scientist Showcase, yes, webinar, which is titled Exposure to Phthalates and Aging. Our moderator today is Sarah Howard, founder and manager of diabetesandenvironment.org. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speakers to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period, and we'll follow up on, on unanswered questions after the webinar. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on our webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speakers. This webinar is scheduled to last for 45 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Sarah. Thank you, Hannah. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Today, HEADS, which stands for Healthy Environment and Endocrine Disruptor Strategies, together with CHE, which is the Collaborative on Health and the Environment, are starting a new webinar series called the Young EDC Scientists Showcase. Yes. The HEADS Mentoring Working Group initiated this series as an opportunity for early career scientists, like PhD students, postdocs, for example, to present their research. And this is our very first webinar in the series. If you wanna sign up for announcements of future webinars, you can go to heads.org and sign up for the HEADS newsletter and we'll announce them there. So today our topic is phthalates and aging. We have two speakers, which will be followed by a question and answer period. And as Hannah said, you can type your questions at any time into the Q&A box and I'll read them after both speakers are finished. So our first speaker is Emily Brem. She's a PhD candidate in Dr. Jody Flaw's lab at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Illinois. She's been working in the lab since 2014, first as a technician, and she began her PhD work there in 2017. And she's gonna talk about how phthalates influence reproductive aging in the mouse. And then she'll be followed by our second speaker, who is Katherine Hatcher. She's a PhD candidate in Dr. Megan Mahoney's lab, also at the College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Illinois. She'll be, soon be a postdoc at Albany Medical College here in upstate, upstate New York, where I live. She's also the host of the Endocrine, Endocrine Disruptors podcast, which you can find at endocrinepod.com, which I would highly recommend. She is going to present her research on exposure to phthalates and menopause symptoms. So Emily, you may begin. Well, thank you so much, um, Sarah and Hannah, for that introduction, and thank you all for attending this web web webinar today. Um, my name is Emily, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Illinois. And before I get started, I um, just want to give an outline. Okay, sorry, an outline of my study, which I'm going to talk about some background leading to my hypothesis and then my experimental design leading to results, my overall summary, future directions that I'm working on now and plan to work on in the future, and then acknowledgement. So my study is focusing on a group of chemicals called phthalates. Phthalates are used in many different consumer products like medical bags and IV tubing, PVC pipes, children's toys, food storage containers, and personal care products like perfume. And since phthalates are used in so many different consumer products, humans are exposed daily via ingestion, inhalation, and dermal contact. So phthalates are known endocrine disrupting chemicals and have been shown to negatively affect both male and female reproduction. So in males, phthalates have been shown to decrease sperm quality, delay prepucial separation, which is an indicator of puberty, and reduce annual genital distance, which can be a marker for decreased testosterone. And in females, Phthalates have been shown to accelerate primordial follicle recruitment, 
disrupt estrocyclicity and inhibit ovarian stereogenesis or the production of sex steroid hormones. So many studies like the ones I talked about on the previous slide focus on exposure to single phthalates, but as humans, we're exposed to mixtures of chemicals like phthalates on a daily basis, which is why I was interested in a phthalate mixture. So this mixture is based on the phthalate metabolite levels of pregnant women in central Illinois in a study conducted here at the University of Illinois by Dr. Susan Schantz, which is the iKids study. It consists of six different phthalates that are shown here in this pie chart. And this includes diethyl phthalate or DEP, di-2-ethylhexyl phthalate or DEHP, dibutyl phthalate or DBP, diisononyl phthalate or DINP, diisobutyl phthalate or DIBP, and benzobutyl phthalate or BZBP. So many studies that affect or that examine reproductive effects of phthalates don't focus on reproductive aging, so I'm interested to determine if these phthalates can affect reproductive aging. So normal reproductive aging in females is characterized by a depletion of the follicle pool. So females are born with a finite number of follicles and this decreases as a female ages. There's also a dysregulation of the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis or HPG axis, and this includes um, with reproductive aging having increases in gonadotropin hormones, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, but decreases in sex steroid hormones like estradiol, testosterone, and progesterone, and the peptide hormone in HIV and B. There's also acyclicity or the lack of normal cycle, and all of these together can lead to decreased fertility. In addition, the ovary can exhibit direct signs of aging by having increased inflammation, fibrosis, reactive oxygen species, and in rodents, there's an increase in the occurrence of cysts. So besides focusing on phthalates and reproductive aging, I plan on examining how prenatal exposure may cause multi-generational or transgenerational effects on female reproductive aging. So with these transgenerational effects, exposure is different for each generation. So in our studies in our lab, we dose pregnant mice from gestational day 10.5 to birth. So here we have our F0 generation, our pregnant dam, and within this pregnant dam, we have the developing pup, and within this developing pup, we have the developing gamete. So the F1 generation is exposed as the developing pup within this uh, pregnant dam, and the F2 generation is exposed as the developing gamete within this developing pup. So any effects that we see in the F1 or F2 generations are considered multi-generational. However, in the F3 generation, this is the first generation that does not have direct exposure. However, there is ancestral exposure. So effects we see here are considered transgenerational. So we know that phthalates can affect female reproduction, and studies have shown that these effects can occur in multiple generations. But it's not known if prenatal exposure to a mixture of phthalates will accelerate reproductive aging in multiple generations of female mice which leads to my hypothesis of my study that prenatal exposure to a mixture of phthalates accelerates reproductive aging in multiple generations of female mice. So for our experimental design, our lab dosed pregnant CD1 mice are of zero generation from gestational day 10.5 to birth with either our control, which is cough, raw, shrift, corn oil, or one of four doses of a phthalate mixture. So we chose the 20 microgram dose of this mixture because this falls within the range of human exposure and some occupational exposure. We chose 200 milligrams because this falls within the range of some medical exposure. And we have 500 milligrams to be able to have a high dose to compare to other toxicology studies. So after dosing this F0 generation, we created our F1 generation. And these F1 females are mated with non-treated males to create the F2 generation. And the F2 females are mated with non-treated males to create the F3 generation. And after we created all three generations, when these mice reach 13 months of age, we collect tissues. So just to give you an idea, if we would expect CD1 mice to exhibit these signs of aging around 15 months. So if we observe effects at 13 months, this would be accelerated compared to our control mice. In addition, just to give you an idea in comparison with women, Mice at 13 months could be compared to women approximately in their late 30s or early 40s. So after we collect these tissues at 13 months, 
We collect the ovaries to examine follicle numbers and if there's cysts present. We collect the sera to look at hormone levels. And two weeks before tissue collections, we monitor their estrocyclicity um, by performing daily vaginal lavage. So to get started with my results, I'm going to talk about the estrocyclicity that was performed for two weeks before the tissues were collected. So just to talk about my graphs here on the x-axis, I have the different stages being proestrous, estrous, and metaestrous and diestrous. And in our lab, we combine metaestrous and diestrous because they're similar in both hormone profile and cytology. And here on the y-axis, I have the percent of days. And for my treatment groups for this graph and rest of the graphs in my presentation, I have the control, which is the slightest orange color, and this gets darker as my dose increases. So I actually didn't have changes in the F1 or F2 generations, which is why I only have the F3 graph here. So in the F3 generation, I did not have changes in proestrous, but with estrus, we had decreases in the 20 microgram and 200 microgram group, and also the 500 milligram group. And with metaestrus and diestrus, we had increases in the 20 and 200 microgram group and the 500 milligram treatment group. So as mice, or as rodents age, they exhibit persistent estrus with their cycle, and then they exhibit persistent diestrus, and eventually they don't cycle at all. So we're seeing that our mice are spending majority of their time in metaestrus and diestrus, indicating um, an irregular cycle, which would be expected with reproductive aging. And this is happening sooner than our control-treated mice. So next, next, I examine the ovaries of these females. So for this graph, I have the different follicle types on the x-axis being primordial, primary, preantral, and antral. And as I previously said, females are born with a finite number of follicles, and this decreases as a female ages. And the follicles transition through these different stages to be able to have antral follicles for successful reproduction. So if there's any effects on this follicle pool, this could have negative effects on reproduction. So on the x-axis is my follicle types, and on the y-axis I have the number of follicles. So the only change in the F1 generation on follicle numbers that we found was a borderline decrease in the 200 microgram group. So this mixture may be causing these females to have a depletion in their follicle pool, and this is happening sooner than the control-treated animals. Something else that we found when looking at these F1 ovaries is that there was an increase in cystic ovaries, which is... Um, common in aging rodents. So just to show you what these uh, cystic ovaries look like, here on the left, I have a picture with a cystic ovary here, and this is a normal size ovary that we would expect um, during tissue collections. So on the right, I have a table showing a number of females that did have cystic ovaries. So here on the left is the treatment groups, ranging from control to 500 milligram. And on the right, I have the percent of ovaries with cysts. So how I got this number is what I did was take the number of ovaries in this treatment group that did have cysts divided by the total number of ovaries in the treatment group times 100. So the control treatment group had around 33% and all the uh, phthalate mixture treatment groups had increased numbers compared to that. Specifically in the 200 microgram group, we had almost 78% of the ovaries that were cystic. So we are seeing an increase in this occurrence of cystic ovaries, which is an indicator of reproductive aging in um, female mice. So next, I examined the percent of follicles in the F2 and F3 generations, and we examined the percent to show the shift in the follicle pool. So for these graphs, again, on the x-axis, I have the different follicle types being primordial, primary, preantral, and antral. And on the y-axis, I have the percent of follicles. So in the F2 generations, we did not have changes in the primordial follicles, but for the primary follicles, we had an increase in the percent here in the 20 and 200 microgram group. There were no change in the percent of preantral follicles, and for antral follicles, we had a decrease in the 200 milligram group. Next in the F3 generation, we had no change in the percent of primordial follicles, but did have an increase in the percent of primary follicles in the 20 microgram and the 500 milligram group, with decreases in the percent of preantral follicles in the 20 and 200 microgram group. However, we had no change in the antral follicle group. So in the F2 and F3 generations, this mixture is increasing the percent of these smaller growing, growing follicles and decreasing the percent of these larger and or preovulatory follicles. So this is showing some negative effects on the follicle pool as these females are aging. 
So next I'm going to talk about the hormone levels after collecting sera from these female mice. So first I'm looking at the sex steroid hormones, progesterone and testosterone. And for these graphs, on the x-axis, I have the different generations being the F1 generation, F2 generation, and the F3 generation. And on the y-axis, I have the different units for each hormone. So for progesterone, we did not have a change in the F1 generation, but in the F2 generation, we had a decrease in the 200 microgram and 200 milligram group. And again, no change in the F3 generation as well. For testosterone, we had changes in the F1 generation with decreases in the 200 and 500 milligram treatment group. Then the F2 generation, we had decreases in the 200 microgram, 200 milligram, and 500 milligram group compared to control, but no changes in the levels of testosterone in the F3 generation. So these mice did have decreases in the sex steroid hormones of progesterone and testosterone in both the F1 and F2 generations, showing that these uh, this mixture is accelerating this decline in the sex steroid hormones, which we would expect with reproductive aging. Next, we looked at the gonadotropin hormones, follicle stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone. So in the F1 generation for FSH, we had increases in actually every treatment group compared to the control level or control treatment group of um, levels of FSH. However, there were no changes in the F2 or F3 generations. And with LH, in the F1 generation, we had increases in the 200 and 500 milligram group compared to control. And in the F2 generation, there was no change in any treatment group compared to control. And last, in the F3 generation, we had borderline decreases in the 200 and 500 milligram group compared to control. So with normal reproductive aging, we would expect these gonadotropin hormones to increase, which we did observe in the F1 generation. So again, these mice are having are exhibiting some signs of accelerated reproductive aging by having this increase in these gonadotropin hormones. So overall, this phthalate mixture is accelerating some biomarkers of reproductive aging by increasing the time these mice spent in metaestrus and diestrus, showing that they're not really cycling normal altering their follicle pool, and dysregulating this HPG axis by causing decreases in sex steroid hormones and increases in gonadotropin hormones. So in conclusion, prenatal exposure to an environmentally relevant phthalate mixture accelerates some biomarkers of reproductive aging in a multiple and transgenerational manner in female mice. So in the future, currently in in the next um, few months, I want to determine if phthalates will accelerate the aging of the ovary by increasing fibrosis, reactive oxygen species, and inflammation. And I also am interested to see if this phthalate mixture accelerates the decline in reproductive capacity of these mice by causing them to have um, more regular cycles and have decreased fertility quicker than the control treated mice. And I'll be starting that by examining the cyclicity of these mice and the fertility of these mice at 10 months of age and monitoring that every two months. So with that, I'd like to thank my, well, the Flaws Lab and of course my advisor, Dr. Jody Flaws. I'd like to thank past lab member, Dr. CQ Joe for starting this project a few years ago. And of course I couldn't do any of this without the funding. And I'd also like to thank again, Keeds and Che for the opportunity to share my research with you all. Hey, thank you so much, Emily. While we're waiting for our next speaker to pull up her slides, I would like to remind you to submit your questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We will begin the Q&A session after Catherine's presentation. Catherine, you want to take it away? Yes, I <laughs> just wanted to make sure I was unmuted. You can see my screen okay? Emily, nod your head. Yes, we can see. <laughs> okay, just wanted to make sure. Um, all right. So today I'm really excited to talk to you about one of the studies that are some of the data that's coming out of one of the studies from my doctoral research um, that I actually just resubmitted for publication today. So fingers crossed. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about the relationship between phthalate exposure and self-reported sleep disruptions in a population of menopausal women. So we know that up to 60% of midlife women experience poor sleep quality. So this is going to be affecting six out of every, oh, up to six out of every 10 midlife women. 
And we know that sleep gets worse as women progress through the menopause transition. So as they go through uh, the various stages of menopause and as they continue through their midlife. And this is even when we control for age. And so we're really seeing a relationship between um, poor sleep quality and progression through menopause. We know that women with poor sleep quality also experience impairments to their overall quality of life, as well as their overall health. And so identifying what risk factors influence sleep is critical so that we can understand um, potential targets uh, for, thera for therapeutics or interventions to improve overall quality of life in populations of midlife women. One thing we also know, and it's been pretty well studied in a, hand, in a big or decent group of uh, studies, we've seen that various hormones associated with reproductive uh, aging are also associated with sleep quality. So as Emily talked about um, previously, we know that FSH or follicle stimulating hormone tends to increase as women go through reproductive aging and levels of reproductive steroids or ovarian steroids tend to decrease. And some studies have shown that as FSH gets higher and estradiol gets lower, women with those um, changing hormones tend to report more impairments to their sleep. Other studies have also shown that there are relationships between other hormones that change during the menopause transition, like increased levels of inhibin B, reduced levels of progesterone, and then altered, uh, altered ratios of various hormones to one another. Those have also been associated with sleep quality in midlife women. And so we know that hormones are related to sleep, and this would suggest that chemicals that are able to disrupt normal hormone profiles could potentially be influencing sleep as well. And our lab is particularly interested in phthalates, and I'm not going to go into as much detail as phthalates as Emily gave us a great background to them, but I wanted to give a brief reason why we're interested in these. So first of all, we know that exposure to phthalates uh, modulates hormones known to be associated with sleep quality. As Emily showed in her study, they're seeing that phthalate exposure influences testosterone and progesterone levels. Other studies have shown that um, phthalate exposure also influences FSH, like Emily showed, or progesterone or testosterone or estradiol. And so those hormones have all been associated with sleep quality in midlife women. So it's possible that exposure to phthalates could also be associated with sleep quality. One study, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail on the next slide, one study found that higher exposure to phthalates increases nighttime awakenings in adults. And this was in adult men and women. And then another study from Dr. Jody Flaws's lab showed that a higher phthalate exposure specifically to phthalates from personal care products was associated with increased hot flashes in midlife women. And phthalates, as Emily mentioned, are a class of plasticizers. They're used in polyvinyl chloride plastics as well as chemical stabilizers in various industrial compounds. There are multiple sources of exposure that we're interested in, particularly personal care products like cosmetics and makeup um, and uh, uh, nail polish, fragrances and other personal care products, as well as food packaging and other plastics like medical plastics, IV bags and IV tubing. There are many different sources of exposure for phthalates and this is just to kind of highlight a few of them. So what do we know about the impact of phthalate exposure on sleep? Well, currently not a lot. Not a lot of people have really looked into this. Like I mentioned, there was that one study that looked at phthalate exposure and various measures of sleep in adults. This was from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES. This is a large population-based survey across the United States. And so it really gives us a good picture of what's going on across the nation. And they found across all of these different um, compounds that they were looking into, increased exposure to this uh, phthalate metabolite monocyclohexyl phthalate was associated with waking up at night more often. And this was in both adult men and women. And the age range was, I believe, starting at around 18 and going all the way up into the 70s. So this really gave us a very broad range of individuals. Preliminary studies from our group has shown that increased exposure to or increased levels of mono-3-carboxypropyl phthalate, which is another phthalate metabolite, 
is associated with increased frequency of restless sleep. And we also found that increased monomethyl phthalate was associated with increased frequency of insomnia. So out of what I've seen, this is all we know about the uh, influence of phthalate exposure on sleep so far. And so my research across my entire dissertation, I'm really interested in looking at how phthalate exposure and endogenous hormones influence sleep disruptions. So I'm thinking that phthalate exposure is likely influencing sleep as endogenous hormones also influence sleep, sleep as well. Overall, just for today's talk, I'm focusing on phthalate exposure and how they affect or how they're associated with sleep disruptions. Um, I have some data on hormones as well, if people have questions about that too. Um, my overall hypothesis for my study is that increased phthalate exposure will be associated with increased frequency, frequency of sleep disruptions, as that's what the few bits of information have been alluding to. So this study, I'm specifically using data from a population known as the Midlife Women's Health Study. I'll abbreviate it throughout the talk as MWHS. This study was established by Dr. Jody Flaws and her team at Johns Hopkins. It's a longitudinal based study where they recruited women from the Baltimore, Maryland area and surrounding counties in the mid early 2000s. Women were recruited if they were aged 45 to 54, which is considered midlife. Um, pre and perimenopausal women were included in the study. Any women that were identified as postmenopausal were not included in the analysis. The overall goal of the initial study was to identify risk factors for hot flashes in perimenopause. And so my study particularly is a secondary analysis of this existing data set. The exclusion criteria for this population include hormone therapies. And so this is like uh, different hormone treatments, uh, oral contraceptives or botanical therapies, an oophorectomy or removal of the ovaries and hysterectomy, Pre and then previously, women previously diagnosed with reproductive cancers. And so when women were enrolled in the study, they came into the clinic to complete a survey about their demographics and various symptoms. They also completed a depression indice or the CESD, which is a very common depression index. So basically higher scores on this index indicate more depressive symptoms. And then they also completed three questions about subjective sleep, which I'll talk about in a second. They came back for four or three additional weeks. So for four weeks total across an entire month to submit a urine and serum sera sample. We did not, I'm not talking about serum here because that's related to the hormone data, but for purposes of today's talk, we collected a urine sample from each week and then pooled those samples to analyze their average exposure to different phthalate metabolites across the month. And we measured those phthalate metabolites using HPLC mass spec um, and on the pooled sample. Those three sleep questions that I mentioned, we were specifically looking into the frequency of different sleep disruptions. So we looked into how frequent are their sleep is, insomnia, and restless sleep. And importantly, this is to um, report their sleep levels or the, their frequency of these sleep uh, levels um, in this survey. Sorry, my internet was saying it was unstable. So, <laughs> um, and for our phthalate exposure, we specifically measured five different summary measures of phthalate exposure. And these are based off of specific metabolites that I'm more than happy to talk about in questions if there are any, but just for purposes of brevity, I'm going to just talk about the summary measures. So first we have some PCP, which is representative of metabolites specifically from personal care products. Some DEHP are metabolites from uh, di2-ethylhexyl phthalate, which is a very common phthalate, uh, phthalate used. Some AA estimates exposure to metabolites with known antiandrogenic activity. Some plastic estimates exposure to metabolites from plastic uh, sources. And then some all calculates the summary measure of all phthalate metabolites that we measured in our study. 
An important thing to note, although I don't have the data on this slide, the metabolite levels that we had to calculate these summary measures were very similar to the um, exposure levels in the national sample of adult women. So we compared our metabolite levels to those from NHANES, adult women from NHANES around the same time, and saw that our range of exposure was very similar. So even though this is a smaller specific population of women, the exposure levels are similar to a national sample. And just to briefly overview, uh, the first analysis that I did, I was one uh, interested in finding out if phthalate exposure influences sleep disruption. So what is this relationship here? In order to do this, I uh, took the five summary phthalate measures and then using ordinal logistic regression, I looked at how they were associated with frequency of sleep disruptions. And women answered uh, basically on a one to five scale, whether or not they were experiencing these sleep disruptions, never, rarely, sometimes, frequently, or regularly. So essentially what ordinal logistic regression does is it looks into how as one phthalate level increases, how does that, uh, how is that associated with a woman's odd of, odds of reporting various frequencies of sleep disruptions? And then in this analysis, we adjusted for specific covariates that are known to influence either sleep or potentially be related to phthalate exposure. We adjusted for menopause status, body mass index or BMI, self-reported hot flashes at night, so whether or not they were experiencing hot flashes at night, present quality of life, and then their depressive symptoms. We also stratified our analysis by smoking status. Basically, this means we looked at these relationships between phthalates and sleep, specifically in non-smokers, former smokers, and current smokers. We broke that up because at least in our population and several other studies have shown that smoking uh, status is related to sleep quality and sleep levels. So we wanted to make sure we were controlling for potential confound of uh, smoking status. So for my data, I'm going to be presenting most of my results in what are known as these forest plots. And just in case you haven't seen them before, I want to give a very brief overview of what you'll be seeing. And so there's this line down the middle that basically is indicating a beta coefficient of zero. If it falls to the left of that line, it means that it's a negative association. So lower levels of that phthalate are going to be associated with a higher frequency of that symptom. The opposite holds true. If they fall on the right side of this line, higher levels of that phthalate will be associated with higher frequency of that symptom. If they cross the line, however, they're not considered significant associations. So you can see both non-smoker and current smoker here are not considered significant, whereas the relationship in former smokers is considered significant because it does not cross that line. So overall, um, in sleep disturbances, Looking at some PCP exposure, so again, this is exposure levels to personal care products or phthalate metabolites from personal care products. We are seeing that there's a negative association between some PCP levels and uh, sleep, the frequency of sleep disturbances only in former smokers. And this trend kind of holds true as we go through. So this means lower levels of some PCP are actually associated with higher frequency of sleep disturbances. So these women are reporting more frequent sleep disturbances at lower levels of this exposure. We see a similar relationship with some all, but only in former smokers, and that lower levels are associated with higher frequency. We also see with some PECP and some DEHP, again in former smokers, lower levels of these summary phthalate measures are associated with higher frequency of insomnia symptoms. Again, for some plastic and some all. So again, these are plastic metabolites from plastic sources and then all the metabolites we measured. Again, in former smokers only, we're seeing a negative relationship. So lower levels of these phthalates are associated with more frequent insomnia. And then finally, for restless sleep, again, we're seeing the same kind of relationship. Lower levels of some PCP and some all are associated with higher frequency of restless sleep in former smokers um, only. <coughs> Excuse me. So we were very interested in this relationship. This was opposite of what we expected. Based off of studies that have looked into 
um, the metabolites and their associations with frequency of symptoms, it seemed to be a positive relationship. But when we looked at these summary measures, it was negative. So we decided to kind of break this down a little bit more and look into quartiles of exposure. So we were interested in, do women, is there a difference in how phthalates are associated with sleep disruptions in the lower levels of exposure versus the higher levels of exposure? So we ran basically the same exact analysis that I had just talked about before. The only difference was instead of looking at um, just the general exposure to phthalates, we broke women into groups, either quartile one of exposure or quartiles two through four of exposure. And we broke it down this way because most women are actually falling in this quartile one of exposure, but there are some women obviously who are going to be exposed to higher levels. And so we wanted to have a more represented distribution of our population. So we lumped all of these quartiles together. So I'm gonna probably refer to these as lower exposure and higher exposure, but again, I'm referring to quartile one versus quartiles two through four. And again, we're looking at the relationship between these different phthalates and how they're associated with um, increased frequency of these sleep disruptions. And we're starting to see an interesting relationship when we break it down this way. Uh, this here is a box plot representing some plastic exposure on the y-axis and how women answered their frequency of sleep disturbances on the x-axis. This is specifically women in quartile one. The red or the box on the left side of each level of this frequency is the actual observed value in our study. So this is what women are actually answering. And then the blue is the predicted value based off of our regression model. And overall, what this is telling us is that actually in this quartile one of exposure, so women that fall into that lower level of exposure, there's actually a negative relationship between some plastic and frequency of sleep disturbances. What this means is, is that we, as we get to lower levels of some plastic exposure, so down here in the lower levels, we're actually seeing more frequent or we're predicting more frequent sleep disturbances in this population. Alternatively, when we look at the higher levels of exposure, so the higher quartiles, we see the opposite relationship ring true and that higher levels of some plastic exposure are actually going to be associated with, or predicted to be associated with more frequent sleep disturbances. So this is kind of getting toward that non-monotonic response that we would sometimes anticipate from some endocrine disrupting chemicals. Um, we're seeing that basically lower levels of exposure are associated with more frequent sleep disturbances when we look at that quartile one and then higher levels of exposure are associated with more frequent sleep disturbances when we look at quartiles two through four. And again, this is the relationship between some plastic and sleep disturbances. However, it's important to note, I must say this, is that these relationships were only significant in former smokers for quartile one and non-smokers in quartile two through four. So it's kind of alluding to, again, that this, the smoking status or women's experience with smoking or history of smoking seems to be a pretty important factor to also consider in these relationships. And just to uh, show again, we're seeing a similar relationship between some plastic and the frequency of insomnia as opposed to sleep disturbances in quartile one. And that lower levels of some plastic are predictive of um, more frequent uh, insomnia in our population. However, just like before, this was only significant in former smokers. So I threw a lot of data at you. Um, there's a lot of information in, in this uh, study, but overall what we're seeing, interestingly, and kind of opposite of our hypothesis, is that actually lower levels of these summary phthalate measures are associated with more frequent sleep disturbances, insomnia, or restless sleep. Um, we are seeing that there may be an interesting positive relationship in the higher quartile of exposure, but this was again dependent upon smoking status. So the direction of the association seems to be predominantly dependent upon both smoking status and the quartile of exposure. So overall, I'm concluding that we are seeing that phthalate exposure is associated with sleep disruptions in midlife women. 
However, there seems to be an important confounding factor to consider of smoking status. And so future studies that may look into this should also consider um, looking into smoking uh, factors as well. It also makes me think that other endocrine disrupting chemicals may also be associated with sleep quality in this population. So this is something I'm going to be looking into for my literature review, but it may be something for future studies to also explore as well. And with that, I would like to thank all of the people who have made this work possible. I have a fantastic committee, including my advisor, Megan Mahoney. Um, they have been making sure I get through and finish my PhD actually in a couple of weeks. Um, and then of course, all of the funding sources who have made this work possible, all of, including Jody and her group for allowing me to use this data or these data, as well as um, Dr. Becky Smith, who is an amazing statistician and epidemiologist who I work very closely with, and then also our hosts today for creating this platform and allowing us to come in and talk to you about our research. And with that, I would like to thank all of you for listening, and I know Emily and I are both eager to take some questions. Great, thank you so much, Catherine. Yeah. I know it's time for our Q&A session. Uh, you may type in your questions to the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can. We will follow up with, on our questions, any questions we did not get to after the webinar. Sarah, would you like to take the first one? Sure, hi, thank you guys. Um, I'm just gonna jump in here. So for Emily, um, I wanna, so Catherine was talking about the, the non-linear effects. Um, do you, one question is, you're seeing effects of the 200 UG per kilogram per day dose level in many cases, but not at higher doses. Do you think this could be evidence of an, <sighs> my speaker's not working, um, of a nonlinear dose response? You're Emily, muted. you're muted. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> so you were asking about seeing effects at like 200 microgram rather than our higher doses? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, I do think this is typical of the endocrine disruptors that usually show either a U-shape or bell-shaped curves where we have effects at the lower levels um, compared to the higher levels where we didn't see as many changes. Okay. Is my speaker working? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm going to jump down to a question for um, Catherine. Urine samples collected every week and pooled to determine hormone content. The question is how stable the hormones remain over time once they are collected and how are the samples preserved? And do you consider determining the hormone content right away to avoid possible changes when stored or preserved? That's a great question. Um, so we collected both sera and urine samples for hormone and phthalate analysis respectively. And from what we're seeing based off of other previous studies that have looked into long-term exposure or long-term storage of these types of samples, there doesn't seem to be much degradation as long as you don't, as long as you store them at minus 80, which we do. And then as long as you don't freeze thaw them consistently like multiple times in order to measure various outcomes, which we don't. We tend to, um, we aliquot the samples in order to make sure that we're not go, we're not putting the samples through multiple freeze thaws. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, it would be nice to be able to measure these immediately, but when you have over 700 women um, and with multiple samples, it would be, you know, it would require an army to be able to run all of those samples at one time. But uh, it definitely is something, you know, a small caveat to consider is that there may be some slight degradation occurring in response to long-term storage, but it doesn't appear to be, based off of other studies that have looked into, it doesn't appear to have a long-term effect. But it is a great question. All right. Um, Emily, um, one person asked about the single phthalates in your study and observed that um, DEP, for example, is not seen to be a reproductive toxicant, toxicant in rodents. And do you have any plans to test whether DEP alone is having effect 
on rats on its own? Or could it be the in or could it be influencing the effect of the other known reproductive toxicant phthalates? So we I think eventually in the future, our lab would probably look at um, other single phthalates. We've looked at DHP, single exposure to uh, DHP, and we actually found similar effects with the reproductive aging where we had um, these mice not really cycling very well, and they had these same changes in their um, hormone levels, and we had decreases in their um, follicle counts as they were aging. Um, but I think, yeah, eventually it would be interesting to look at the other single phthalates to see if they're having similar effects. All right. Um, and maybe for both of you, are there potential influences of the molecular weight of phthalates on the health impacts, like high molecular weight versus um, those found in fragrances? Or is that less important than metabolites? I don't know if the molecular weight itself is affecting it, but like I know that some folks, I believe Emily from your lab, Genoa, has looked into like differences between low and high yeah, molecular the weight palate sources. Yeah. But I don't know anything specifically. It is an important question because the molecular weight of a particular phthalate would tell us it doesn't, uh, that's not the reason why, or it would tell us the, so I guess, the source of exposure. The molecular weight itself isn't telling us the exposure, but um, different phthalates are used in different, for different reasons based off of their molecular weight, I think. This isn't my area of expertise, but that's my general <laughs> understanding. Um, so it definitely is something, when somebody is studying these relationships, I think it's important to consider, you know, the source of exposure uh, of the particular phthalate that you would be looking into, but I don't know a lot about the molecular weight itself. Okay. Um, I'm just going to real quick, we're kind of out of time, but I'm going to keep going for a little bit. <laughs> uh, Catherine, do you have any thoughts on the mechanisms involved? Someone said, I noticed the anti-androgenic phthalate sum was not associated with sleep disturbances. Is there any mechanism data on the others that were associated that might suggest potential causal mechanisms? That's a fantastic question. And I'm going to give a general answer because my long answer would be, I haven't looked into it yet, but I'm going to very soon because it's part of my lit review of my dissertation. But um, <laughs> uh, there's kind of three or two major thoughts that I have in terms of how phthalates may be influencing um, sleep in menopausal women. The first is that it could be acting, or phthalates could potentially, or their metabolites could be acting directly on the brain. Um, many of the brain areas that are involved in regulating sleep and wake behaviors are known to be influenced by hormones, particularly just because of what's been studied the most, estradiol, uh, progesterone, and testosterone have all been shown to influence these brain areas. So theoretically, if phthalates are either disrupting those hormones or able to act similarly or antagonize those hormones at the receptor level, they could be influencing those brain areas for sure. And that could be influencing sleep too. So like progesterone is generally thought to be a hypnotic or that it induces more sleep. And estradiol is generally thought to induce more wake behaviors. So if phthalates are affecting those, the function of those hormones, they could be um, affecting sleep in that way. The other thought that I have is that phthalates could be indirectly influencing sleep um, by altering other symptoms that are closely related to uh, sleep quality too. So if phthalates are influencing depression, which several animal studies have shown and several human studies have shown associations between phthalates and depression, if they're associated, if phthalates are influencing depression in midlife women, theoretically that could also be influencing their perception of their sleep or how their sleep is, is going, I guess. Um, and then similarly, if phthalates are influencing hot flashes, which again, it appears that they, they might be, uh, phthalates could, or that increase in hot flashes or altered hot flash experience could also be influencing sleep. So I have this kind of idea of either direct mechanism, which we would have to get into animal studies, which from my understanding, I don't think many have been done um, in the context of sleep. Um, and then, or it could be like a more indirect effect 
influencing some other uh, symptom that may be associated with sleep. Long-winded answer, I guess. All right, I, I think we're gonna have to cut it off here. Um, but thank you, both of you, for speaking. And Hannah, do you want to close it? Yeah, great job, Emily and Catherine. Thank you for sharing your research with us. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, too, for moderating. We're approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on Chase's website soon, and tomorrow you'll receive an email containing a link to the video. The next Che webinar will take place on Tuesday, May 19th and is titled Disinfecting, Cleaning, and Best Practices for Protecting Your Family During the COVID-19 Pandemic. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events or more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website at healthandenvironment.org. Additionally, if you appreciate Che's partnership webinars bringing you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support Che's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speakers, Emily and Catherine, again, for taking the time today to present, and to you, Sarah, for your excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. Stay healthy and well.